On May 17, 2020, a Canadian Forces CT-114 Tudor aircraft flown by the Snowbirds Aerial Demonstration Team crashed in British Columbia. The unsuccessful ejection attempt injured the pilot and killed Public Affairs Officer Captain Jennifer Casey. That mishap report has been released to the public, and today we're going to take a look at the cause of the crash and why that ejection attempt was unsuccessful. The mishap was tragic. Captain Casey was well known through social media and her work with the Snowbirds demonstration team. And the Snowbirds team is an awesome team uh, known worldwide for their outstanding performance and flying abilities. It happened at the beginning of some of the lockdowns and um, trying to inspire people through their aerial demonstrations. Very tragic loss of such an outstanding officer and person um, in an mishap that probably could have been avoided and we'll talk about uh, the causes and kind of the recommendations and stuff like that that came out of the report. As always we'll just look at the facts and analyze. I'll try to explain as best I can uh, and kind of translate some of the uh, pilot speak and safety speak uh, into something digestible. We're only going to look at the actual facts. We're not going to speculate or anything like that uh, out of respect for uh, Captain Casey and the pilot and those involved. I want to thank the Canadian National Defense Media Relations that sent me this full report. I know it's been uh, last week. I think uh, a lot of news outlets have picked it up and there's a summary uh, on the internet, but I wanted the actual report so we could go through it and analyze it as we've done with other mishaps uh, in the past. So the synopsis on 17th of May, the Snowbirds Air Demonstration Team was operating in Kamloops, British Columbia to reposition the Kamox, British Columbia as part of Operation Inspiration, a task undertaken by the 431st Aerial Demonstration Squadron to travel across Canada in support of frontline workers in the battle against COVID. Remember, this was right at the beginning of the lockdowns, and we were doing this in the United States. Uh, we had Blue Angel flyovers. We had Thunderbird flyovers. We were trying to inspire uh, and thank the healthcare workers for all they were doing. It was number two of a formation of the Tudor aircraft. The two occupants consisted of the pilot and the passenger who was the team's public affairs officer. That's Captain Casey. Following takeoff, a loud impact-like sound was heard by both occupants and the aircraft then experienced a loss of thrust. The pilot initiated a climb straight ahead and then elected to carry left-hand turn back towards the airport. The maneuver resulted in an aerodynamic stall halfway through the turn before the pilot gave the order to abandon the aircraft. Both occupants sub subsequently ejected and the aircraft was destroyed upon impact in the residential area. Passengers succumbed to injuries sustained during the ejection sequence and the pilot received serious injuries. Evidence gathered during the investigation revealed that both occupants' ejection sequences were outside of the ejection envelope. The passenger ejected after the pilot and their ejection seat was observed to fly backwards temporarily after leaving the aircraft. The passenger did not achieve the requisite amount of separation from the seat during the ejection sequence. The most probable cause of the passenger's reverse direction of travel and delayed separation during the ejection sequence was due to the passenger's limb extending into the airstream, which imparted a rotational moment to the ejection seat. The reverse direction of the seat prevented the aero-rigid arm drogue, ARAD, chute from catching the wind and pulling the seat away from the occupant. The chute did eventually release, however, not without causing the seat to rotate backwards its original trajectory, thereby potentially causing collision with the passenger as well as temporary entanglement, further preventing normal distance. DNA evidence collected from the engine's internal components confirmed the ingestion of a bird as witnessed from the video evidence. However, the damage it caused was insufficient to cause a catastrophic failure. Rather, it resulted in a compressor stall that was never cleared. The investigation recommends a directive be published which outlines the crew's priority where an ejection emergency during takeoff or landing phase occurs and has potential to result in ejection near or over a populated area. The investigation also recommends further training on engine-related emergencies in the takeoff low-level environment. It is also recommended the practice of storing items between the ejection seat and airframe wall cease immediately. Finally, further research is recommended into potential option that would stabilize the CT-114 ejection seat from any tendency to pitch, roll, or yaw immediately following its departure from the ejection seat rails. So that's the synopsis. Um, it's a, you have what's called, they'll talk about it, an ejection envelope. So it's basically 
the limitations with which the seat can work. A lot of modern seats have a very wide envelope, zero, zero, up to 600 knots. Older seats like the Tudor and the T-38A that I fly and L-39s that you see in civilian use have a smaller envelope that you can easily find yourself out of at low altitude, low airspeed, high bank angles, uh, or even high airspeeds. So we'll talk about that in a second, but that's really what happened here is it was an unsuccessful ejection uh, after the aerodynamic stall. So when he turned back to the airport, he stalled and they were immediately outside of that envelope. All right, so the factual information uh, we talked about, it was a two flame formation. They took off at approximately 1140 local time, uh, runway nine east towards the city of Kamloops. At approximately 180 feet, fairly low altitude, the landing gear was retracted and a loud impact sound was heard by both occupants. The passenger, which is Captain Casey, verbalized bird and the aircraft then experienced a loss of thrust. So she saw it. She saw the bird uh, go down the, you know, basically coming at him and end up going down the intake. Following a climb straight ahead, the pilot elected to continue the climb with a left hand turn towards the general direction of the airport. So he was climbing out and then decided, OK, I'm going to turn back towards the airport. This will require the airplane to complete a 180 degree turn towards the west, starting from approximately 200 feet AGL. I don't know uh, what the uh, flame out landing pattern uh, procedures are for the Tudor. Uh, in the F-16, uh, we did flame out patterns because we're single engine. So we had the ability to come back and land if we lost an engine. I'm sure they practiced this. I don't know what their min altitude was. Uh, if you remember when we talked with Stormy, they could do it very low altitude because they had that big straight wing on the U-2 uh, and they didn't need a whole lot of room to do it. Uh, but in the F-16, for example, if you were at 200 feet, you wouldn't try to turn back around because you just didn't have enough altitude. You just zoom straight ahead and eject. Uh, you wouldn't try to make a turn unless you were trying to avoid populated areas. Through approximately 70 degrees of left turn, the aircraft increased its bank angle to almost 90 degrees. After a slight pause, the aircraft then rolled rapidly down in the same direction through 270 degrees, ending upright, but with a 45 degrees nose low. So as it turns, it overbanks, because that's when he gets in that Buffett aerodynamic stall, ran out of airspeed, uh, but then recovered, but now he's nose low. Um, Following the roll, the ejection sequence commenced with the right seat departing first, followed thereafter by the left seat. The pilot who was in the right seat landed atop a residential roof. The passenger who was in the left seat landed in the resident's backyard. The aircraft continued in a nose down uncontrolled descent, crashing into an adjacent property. Injury, the pilot received serious injuries while the passenger was fatally injured. Uh, aircraft was destroyed. Collateral damage, you can see um, it hit a neighborhood. Ejection debris was spread over two blocks um, in a straight line, landed on neighboring properties. House where the aircraft crashed suffered extensive damage from the ensuing post-crash fire that enveloped the northwest section of the house. Most of the fuel uh, and other POL burned when the aircraft impacted the ground, rupturing the fuel cells and bursting the flame. Personnel information, he was an experienced pilot, 2,500 hours in the military. He was, fatigue was not a factor. He was qualified for the planned mission. Aircraft information, so the CT-114 Tudor is a Canadian-built low-wing monoplane jet that was used by the Royal Canadian Air Force as a basic pilot training aircraft from 1963 until 2000. So that jet is almost 60 years old, which is a lot like the T-38As that I'm flying now. They are old. They have old instruments. They are the seats. You have to wear a parachute out. Unlike a normal um, newer fighter where the parachute's in the head box, so to speak, uh, and all the stuff is contained. You just hook the harness into the seat and it kind of handles everything. The old seats, like jets that were made in the 60s, like the T-38, T-37, which the T-37 is a lot like the Tudor, except it's twin engine. The older jets, you wear the parachute and then strap into the seat. And it basically is a catapult that throws you out of the airplane. And then you, it separates you from the seat and pulls the chute for you um, as if you're skydiving, if you will. So it's not all in the seat itself, which is why it's not zero, zero. It's a side-by-side -side design. It's a single GE J85 CAN 40 axial turbo flow. Uh, so it's one of the T-38 engines, essentially, uh, 2,700 pounds of thrust, no afterburner. Uh, they have been modified and allow them to use a single pilot airshow aircraft. 
Records indicate that the maintained in accordance with existing regulations and approved procedures serviceable at the time of the occurrence. It had 10,591.5 hours uh, on it at the time of the mishap. Uh, so here's the thing. The ejection system, uh, we talked about the rocket-assisted catapult tally ejection seat, so it's just rocketing you out of the aircraft as a means of emergency egress from 60 to 350 knots. So that's your envelope. It's not a zero-zero seat uh, because you need some airspeed to get that chute to, to inflate and deploy. Uh, indicated airspeed in the uh, aircraft altitude is 150 feet or greater from ground level. These are the absolute minimum ejection seat system limits. It uh, does not talk about the angle of bank, uh, but I'm sure there's some bank limits as well uh, with that. Ejection seats are operated independently of one another by the seat occupant. Same thing, like I said, aircraft. I, I keep, I'm going to keep bringing up the T-38A is because one of them flying now, but they're very, very similar uh, so I'm a little familiar with it, uh, having done that now. Each city is equipped with ejection controls, which consist of loop-type hand grips on both sides. So it's hand grips raise. That's, that's all it is. You, you, you pull the hand grips, and that's what sends you out. Pulling one does not pull the other. There is no inner seat sequencing system. It takes a half-second time delay after the, the hand grips are raised to allow for automatic jettison of the canopy. There is no electromechanical connection between the seats. Each seat will individually apply this half second delay before rejection, regardless if the canopy has already departed or not. So if they both simultaneously go and one goes before the other, it's a half second for the canopy and then another half second, the other seat waits as well for the canopy. It doesn't matter if the canopy is gone or not, it waits a half second before it actually fires. Belt opening is automatic as part of the ejection sequence and it requires no additional assistance from the occupant. As the seat travels up the rails during ejection, a mechanical tripper located near the top of the rails activates the M32A1 one second delay gas initiator, which opens the lap belts. Because remember, we're lap belted in to the seat with the harness and you're also wearing a parachute. So you have to separate from the seat and then the, the chute has to open. An aero rigid arm drogue assembly, ARAD, is fitted in order to improve the seat occupant separation during ejection. The ARAD assembly, which is fitted on the right side of the seat frame, consists of a telescoping ARAD arm assembly and lockdown assembly. The deployment bag, which contains the assist chute and drogue chute, is housed within a drogue chute container above the ARAD arm. The deployment of the drogue chute stabilizes the ejection seat. It also slows the ejection seat in relation to the occupant, thereby allowing for good seat separation where the occupant's parachute is deployed. Primary chute worn by the air crew and passengers is 28 foot diameter flat circular parachute. That's standard. As the occupant is separated from the seat, the parachute opening device arming cable is pulled. So there's a cable, uh, we call it the silver key, that you disconnect from your chute and it hooks into the lap belt. And that is what actually times your chute from firing. That's what, oh, not firing, but opening. That's what opens your chute. Uh, known as the Mark 10 automatic open device, activates the lay mechanism in the parachute pack and at a preset time interval at one second unlocks the aneroid type release, which delays the parachute at preset altitude to 16,000 feet. If it's below, it'll open after the interval. So it just goes on a timer and as soon as that timer expires, it will open the chute because it has to give you time to separate from that seat. Total time required for the, and this is what drives the limitations of the seat. Right, so in a normal like F-16, F-18 seat, it's zero, zero because everything's contained in, in the seat itself and it can open quickly and fully open to get you enough swings in the chute, if you will, to land safely. The reason this is 60 knots and lower alt or higher altitude up to 350 knots is because it has to give you time to get the canopy open, get the seat to fire, get the yourself separated from the seat, and then open the chute that is wedged between you and the back of the seat. So you, you have to get that separation. So it takes a while for that seat to work. Total time is five seconds. Injection sequence is that time beginning with the raising of the hand grips until the parachute is provided in a survival rate of descent. That's usually one or two swings. Uh, if the aircraft is in a dive, in a sink rate condition, or in an alt attitude, inverted wings level banking or turning, that would cause ground impact in less than five seconds. Suggests successful ejection cannot be expected. So that, so that's when they talk about the bank angle, 
you know, so, you know, like we talk about in the T38, if you're in a final turn, a lot of that time, your low altitude, you're out of the ejection seat envelope. Even though you have the airspeed, you don't have the altitude and you have too much of a sink rate, sink rate being in feet per minute, how fast you're descending. Both ejection seats were in their service inspection schedule and all explosive devices were in their service life. Both ejection seats were serviceable at the time of ejection. I believe that. I don't believe that this was a malfunction of the system as designed back in the 50s and 60s. I just believe this was an outdated system that they're using. Uh, for the weather, it was VMC, few clouds at a thousand, uh, no significant ceiling, no significant winds. The first ejection uh, was commenced at an altitude of 441 feet, 113 feet per second at 45 degree nose down angle. And that is expressed as the vertical component of the aircraft speed in feet per second. Video evidence shows the ejection seat briefly rotated about its vertical axis before reversing back to its original flight path as the ARAD chute deployed. Video further illustrates the pilot having a partially inflated chute as they pass a tree line at 4.2 seconds after canopy jettison. In accordance with test and CT-114 operating instructions, it takes five seconds for it to reach a steady state, which means the parachute is descending with the occupant correct rate of descent for the weight of the occupant. It's unlikely that the pilot ever reached that state as the tree line that they pass by is viewed by the video as approximately 40 feet tall and they landed on a roof of a house was 15 feet above the ground. Roof structure materials absorbed the pilot's energy during their landing, thereby reducing the effects of rapid deceleration and subsequent trauma on the human body. That is probably the only reason he's alive is because he hit that roof uh, sloped and it was enough to absorb the impact. They classified it as unsuccessful, survivable. Uh, it occurred inside the airspeed and altitude window. It remained outside the envelope time-wise for the CT-114 ejection due to the nose low attitude and sink rate when it was initiated. So that's why they say it's a zoom climb to get you climbing up because that gives you more time. If you're descending, you have to add your descent rate, which can quickly put you outside that envelope. The second ejection occurred at 0.4 seconds after the pilot at an estimated altitude of 394 feet and an airspeed or speed of 133 feet per second at 50 degree nose down. So it was slightly less. He, she had a little less altitude, a little more uh, sink rate and more nose down angle. So the jet was doing this because it eventually impacted near vertical. Video evidence provided the seat rotating 180 degrees about its vertical axis to the right, then temporarily flying backwards, and they think that's because one of her limbs ended up in the windstream, which caused that rotation. Seat separation also appeared to be delayed. Video evidence showed the passenger passed a tree line 3.6 seconds after canopy jettison, along with the seat in close proximity. Passenger ejection did not reach a steady state as the tree line that they pass is at approximately 40 feet in height, and there's no indication of chute inflation. A combined combination of deceleration through obstructions and impact with the ground result injuries to passengers, which is not survivable. Therefore, it's classified as unsuccessful, unsurvivable. Passenger's ejection occurred inside the airspeed altitude envelope. It was outside the time envelope for the ejection seat to perform properly. Uh, severe nose down altitude and, or attitude and sink rate. So there's a lot of factors that play into a successful uh, ejection here. So they did some testing uh, and then they looked at the video evidence and they found bird ingestion uh, engine having occurred, led to extensive visual search, biological material, which they found. Uh, and that's the bird engine damage. There was no damage to the trailing edge of the inlet guide vanes from the contact from the first stage compressor rotor blades. Evidence of contact damage between the first stage compressor and the inlet guide vanes suggests the inlet guide vanes were closed prior to impact. The first stage compressor rotor blades exhibited both minor hard FOD damage and soft FOD damage. The soft FOD damage consisted with low rotational compressor speed and ingested of soft fiberglass airframe intake. So yeah, bird went down the intake, damaged the blade, which causes a compressor stall. The airflow is now disrupted through those blades because they're airfoils and it can't, it can't spin the blades, get enough airflow through that, and you'll get that pop bang buzz. Um, happened to me with a T-38C uh, when I took a bird down the right intake. Uh, and you're not going to recover that. Once the blades are bent, it's fodded out. It's, you, there's no way to get that motor uh, going again. Enunciator panel inspection results suggest the engine was producing power at the time of impact as only the canopy unlocked bulbs exhibited signs were eliminated. Seven of the turbine nozzle partitions were cracked and blistered in the center of the leading edge. Damage observed to the partition suggests an overheating event, which is consistent and sustained compressor stall. 
This reversal in airflow with no reduction in fuel flow can result in overheat damage to the turbine section due to a reduction in cool air flowing through the compressor stages. Uh, they looked at the engine fuel oil cooler. Uh, no evidence suggests that it was contributory. Um, mechanical damage was observed within the fuel inlet and outlet ports which was consistent with damage previously observed on other engines within the aircraft fleet. Uh, but there was no evidence to suggest this is what happened. O-ring material tested extensively has found the O-rings were brittle, excessively compression set, with excessive compression set that would likely have made the fitting susceptible to leakage. Ongoing study is currently being performed. Uh, so there's some O-ring stuff, but they said it was not contributed to the uh, accident itself. So this is what it looks like. Uh, you can't see the mouse. So uh, in the seat though, looking at the picture, you have parachute shoulder straps and the arming key. That's the little silver key that I was telling you about. T-38 has the same thing. So you wear the parachute and then you strap into the seat, which is different from, again, normal uh, newer ejection seats. Uh, so they looked at training records, uh, the passenger seat qual, because she has to have seat training. So she actually was not current is on paper, but they looked and said, yep, she did have seat training. Investigation discovered the occurrence of air crew had placed items between the seat side of the seat and the airframe wall for both of the ejection seats. These included a laptop and a loose leaf binder. This is a common practice within the 431st. Emergency takeoff briefing, they must consider aircraft ejection system operating limits, personal comfort, surface conditions, and environmental factors for an uh, emergency response. The standard maneuver manual says time is of the essence during takeoff phase, so you must do your thinking on the ground in order to react quickly in the air. Pre-takeoff briefing is essential for a pilot's ability to react instinctively and positively during the takeoff phase. A typical takeoff brief in the tutor, which includes three or more distinct phases in which a specific set of actions would be performed by the pilot should an emergency occur. First phase consists of the moment the brakes are released up until the moment the aircraft is rolling down the runway and about to lift off. If a major malfunction emerges, the pilot could potentially reduce the throttle, apply brakes, and stop the aircraft before going airborne. So this is standard stuff we talk about. Um, we have bold-faced. We have um, takeoff and landing data, go-no-go -go decisions. This is stuff we brief every time. We know the bold-faced. We memorize the bold-faced. We know what happens if we lose an engine at, at different points. Uh, in the flight. We had critical action procedures in the F-16, bold face in the F-18, bold face in the T-38 that you just have to know because there's no time to get off the checklist uh, in a critical phase like this. Second phase is when it's airborne. However, the gear, gear is still down and locked. Should there be an issue, they could actually land. So they take off and, oh, we lost an engine. I can put it right back down. However, the phase is short in duration as the landing gear is raised relatively quickly after takeoff as they produce drag and delays. Third is the most challenging, which is where they were. In this phase, the aircraft's landing gear is stowed and it's at a position space without runway beneath that they can land. Airspeed and altitude is increasing. However, they're still relatively low. So it's that phase where, hey, runway's behind us, can't land again. This is kind of a, an important part. When an aircraft has experienced a loss of thrust, it does not necessarily signify the aircraft can no longer sustain flight. In fact, an aircraft can maintain level flight by continuously raising the nose and reducing its speed to the point of achieving a stall. With a complete engine failure or partial loss of thrust, if the aircraft has an excess of speed, it can trade the excess speed for altitude by performing what is known as zoom. So you're just climbing out, you're zooming, you're trading your altitude, you're trading your airspeed for altitude. It's so a sharp pull in the control column, which changes the altitude of the aircraft and begins to decelerate. The amount of climb is proportional to the amount of speed. When an emergency arises during takeoff, especially one where the issue involves the engine on a single engine aircraft, priority is to obtain as much vertical separation from the ground without delay. Zoom. Zoom stores jet eject. That was one of the things uh, on the F-16. I still remember it to this day. Because uh, we had stores we'd punch off, uh, which gives you less drag and less weight. Time is of the essence as its kinetic and potential energies are still relatively low and will rapidly decay. Regardless of the amount of climb achieved, once established at a higher altitude, the pilot is afforded more time to analyze the situation. That's when they can decide if they can turn back or if the engine's still running, they can apply any other uh, secondary actions. At any time an engine malfunction is suspected, tutor pilots are expected to carry out the suspected engine malfunction checklist. Zoom if possible, wings level, maintain current throttle position, turn on the air start ignition, and take the time to properly analyze the situation, concentration, concentrating on the engine instruments and your condition of flight. Holy crap, that's a lot of words. Consider the possibility of ejection as you may well be in a position where recovery of the engine is to a usable condition may not be possible. The above response is used when the nature of the malfunction is not readily apparent. The intent is to prioritize the climb away from the ground. So their initial action is just climb. 
climb trade airspeed for altitude, get away from the ground, give yourself time to figure out if you need, you're gonna do a, a flame out landing or eject. So loss of thrust compressor stall, zoom if possible, place the throttle to idle, turn on the air start ignition. This is standard. Every jet I've flown is, is pretty much like this. Um, if you have the ability to do that, if it's not a FADEC or something. If, uh, but you can go to afterburner in some jets and that actually hits the igniters going. If there's no immediate relight of the engine, eject or force land if time permits, continue procedure one or two of the relight emergency response. If time does not permit, uh, if you don't have a relight by 2,500 feet AGL, use procedure one and relight. Engine wind up times from the point of relight is 25 to 45 seconds. Immediate response. So now we get into kind of what the pilot did. At the time of the bird strike, he was 190 feet above the ground and 175 knots. The pilot had briefed before takeoff. Should an engine failure uh, arise during this phase, uh, a separation from lead, because he was in a formation, so he was number two, followed by a zoom climb straight ahead would be carried out. Once airborne after a momentary zoom on a straight ahead course, a decision was made to continue with a climbing left-hand turn back towards the general direction of the airport. This would require the aircraft to complete 180 degree turns towards the west starting from 200 feet AGL. Once the turn was commenced, the aircraft bank was progressively increased to the point where the aircraft's lift vector was essentially directly horizontal by the time the aircraft had rolled through 90 degrees of heading change. At this point, the aircraft was heading north and the maximum altitude it achieved was 800 feet. So we got the zoom climb, but not so much. Without thrust, his airspeed decayed and it had an aerodynamic stall to the left and rotated 270 degrees about its longitudinal axis before leveling upright at approximately 440. He had 113 feet per second towards the ground and three seconds to impact, so not within that four to five seconds that he needed. Attempts by CT-114 air crew to turn back towards the airport with a confirmed loss of engine power have been previously documented in flight safety. In these instances, all of which occurred at the same stage of flight as this occurrence, the pilots had commenced a zoom turn towards the airport in an attempt to land on a prepared surface. All occurrences resulted in insufficient energy to perform maneuver, and in all occurrences, the air crew ejected at low out level. Unfortunately, two occurrences resulted in a total of three fatalities. So this is a known thing. They've done it before. They know it doesn't work. And that's what he did. He did something that, you know, in the past they've known doesn't really work. Following the completion of those investigations, Director of Flight Safety stressed the importance of maintaining aircraft control, analyze the situation, timely decision to eject, ensuring the optimum ejection parameters are met. In addition, they further highlighted that the immediate response to a loss of thrust at low level in a single engine jet should be speed permitting. Climb straight ahead to maximize time and therefore options. This is further reflected in the current AOIs, which are the in operating instructions, state a loss of thrust in flight may be caused by an engine flame out or compressor stall. However, the immediate action the immediate reaction to either one is the same. If operating at low altitude is imperative, the wings level zoom be carried out to optimize the ejection parameter. So they stress, don't turn. The pilot's decision to zoom and turn towards the airport by zoom straight ahead was based on the perception that should an ejection be required while maintaining their current heading, it result in the airframe crashing into a populating area. So he knew that this was not against, this was not what procedure dictated, but his assessment was if I keep going, this aircraft's gonna kill a lot of people, so I need to turn back and at least try it to get it into a place where it's not gonna hurt people on the ground. In doing so, however, the potential energy gained by turning and zooming may have been lower than what would have been gained by zooming straight ahead. Not only did the maneuver potentially produce the altitude to be gained, it also channelized the pilot's attention, resulting in the loss of positive control of the aircraft and subsequent stall. So that first step of maintaining aircraft control, he was unable to do that because he was worried about the people on the ground. Command of the eject, this was another thing that, that came up. Immediately following the level off from the aerodynamic stall, so once he finally recovered, and now they're 45 degrees low, nose low, the pilot ejected. Passenger ejected 4.4 seconds after the pilot. This resulted in the passenger's ejection occurring uh, 50 feet lower and 50 degrees nose down out attitude. This is five degrees more. Evidence suggests that the passenger was aware of the emergency situation that a bird strike had occurred and the pilot was attempting to maneuver clear of the lead. However, the sudden roll as a result of the aerodynamic stall halfway through the turn may have come as a surprise, right? Because it's probably kind of violent. The sudden change in trajectory was likely outside the passenger's expectation at that moment in time and could have interrupted their situational awareness. Following the aerodynamic stall, the order to eject was called out by the pilot using the phrase, pull the handle. The word or phrase commonly briefed and used among ejection seat qualified air crew is the word eject and is called out in 
rapid succession in a clear and loud voice, i.e. eject, eject, eject. The format of this command is designed so the passenger initiates ejection upon hearing the first eject of the command, followed by the pilot and the third eject, who initiates their own ejection. The difference in wording may have contributed to the overall confusion and uncertainty, which resulted in the passenger ejected second. This is a thing that happens all the time when we take fam riders uh, flying in the T-38. One of the briefings that I give is we don't use the word eject actually as a command. So when we talk about ejection, so if we're going to discuss, hey, we think we might eject. For us, eject is not a command. We have the same seats. We are not sequenced. So what we have to do is ensure that the passenger, the backseater goes first, and then we go second to give time for that sequence separation. So for us, what, what I brief and what most other T-38A pilots brief is that we will use the command bailout as a command. So bailout, bailout, bailout. On the second bailout, I want you to pull the handle and I'm going to go on the third bailout. So that gives us time to sequence. Now, granted, we're not side by side, we're tandem, but it's the same thing as applies. We give clear commands so they know exactly what it is. Pull the handle may not be, I mean, what handle? The landing gear handle, uh, you know, the canopy handle, what handle are you talking about? So that could definitely delay her ability to eject and she was obviously uh, second out when she should have been first. Now, granted, there's not a lot of time, right? There are a couple seconds from impact. We're Monday morning quarterbacking, something that, you know, is the first thing that comes out. But when you're talking about what could be causal and what could contribute, pull the handle versus the very clear, in their case, eject, 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 is definitely a difference. It is possible the pilot may have also experienced a component of situational surprise following the stall and the expectation was to successfully complete the turning maneuver. That's, I, I agree with that. You know, he just, that's all he could get out because he was busy flying the aircraft. Temporary impairment, resilience, coupled with the time compression may have impacted their choice of verbal command to eject. Yeah, he might have just been, hey, just get out, you know, I mean, at that point. Uh, reverse travel of the seat. Upon further analysis of the video evidence, it became apparent that the passenger's ejection did not proceed as would normally be expected. Video presented the investigation with evidence of the passenger seat flying backwards briefly, almost 180 degrees, with no distance of the passenger from the seat, potentially due to the interference. The investigation could not conclusively determine why, how the seat reversed its direction. Uh, there's three ways that we can explain it. One, uh, it was interfered by objects placed alongside the ejection seat during transit. That's why they talk about putting laptops and loose leaf and stuff. Um, there's no evidence of scarring on the seat supports in this scenario. And it was a very common practice, but not recommended. Scenario two, the seat is essentially connected to the aircraft. Only moment movement possible up these rails adjusted before the bottom. Susceptible changes direction of forces, including those acting on the very tip an airflow. So the fact that the aircraft was uh, a slight rolling movement to the left, just as both occupants ejected, which theoretically could have influenced, because remember, they're side by side, the seat's movement. Uh, but the, the resolution is just not clear enough and they can't really tell. Scenario three, um, the aircraft applying a force to the seat once it left the rails, i.e. arm or leg extended in the airstream, caused a yaw moment. Uh, the phenomenon of limb flail and the subsequent moment it created was recorded back in 1999. Ejection seat had commenced a severe yaw to the mannequin arm extending out in the airstream. This results in the seat flying backwards. So, uh, and that's the mannequin and that's what it looks like. Um, there's not really high uh, visibility on that, but it's the same most probable cause is that limb uh, flying into the airstream. The ejection seat is prone to respond unpredictably once it leaves the ejection seat rails up to the point where the ARAD chute successfully deploys in the airstream. Um, does not contain stabilizers. It's old. I mean, 1960s, you know, early 50s, late 50s. The conclusion, uh, weather and fuel and fatigue were not a factor. Air crew were current qualified. Certain discrepancies were noted in maintenance, uh, promulgation of progress reports and crew training. Mechanical damage was observed in the fuel inlet and outlet ports, which was consistent with previous damage on other engines. Uh, they didn't have a flight data recorder. Pilot received serious injuries. Passenger was fatally injured. Evidence suggests that the bird ingestion is what caused it. Pilot brief the takeoff should an engine malfunction arise. Uh, separation from lead, zoom straight ahead would be carried out. However, they started the left-hand bank towards the general direction of the airport. They stalled at 440 feet. The pilot's decision to zoom turns toward the airport via straight ahead was based on a perception that an ejection would put the aircraft in uh, a populated area. But by doing so, they lost their energy and put themselves in an unsurvivable ejection envelope. Uh, attempts to turn back toward the airport with confirmed loss of engine power have been well documented uh, and they were unsuccessful.
Following the completion of the investigations, they stress maintain aircraft control. We talked about that. Stall condition of the engine would have been displayed by cockpit instruments. It's uncertain whether he was able to process that, though. Investigation discovered the aircrew are known to place items between the side of the seat and airframe. However, there's no they, there's no evidence that says that uh, it interfered, but there's no evidence that it not it didn't. Uh, we talked about pull the handle versus eject eject. That's a confusing thing. Immediately following level off, the pilot was the first to eject. Video evidence shows the ejection seat briefly rotated. Pilot had an inflated chute and never reached steady state. However, the roof broke his fall. Passenger had no such luck. And the investigation could not conclusively identify the cause of the ejection seat rotation, but they think it's because her one of her limbs ended up in the airstream. And they still couldn't figure out why the uh, arming cable was uh, around the ARAD lanyard. Cause factors, ingestion of the bird, uh, pilot decision to zoom and turn, vice straight ahead, potential energy lost, execution of turn back, channelized attention, and pilot uh, losing control into a stall. Not be determined whether the final steps of the engine malfunction checklist was completed and saying eject, eject, eject. Latent cause factor, so I guess this is the primary and the secondary. Following an engine malfunction after takeoff, there exists predisposition for aircrew to execute a turn back towards the airport and attempt to land on a prepared surface. Such attempts have proven unsuccessful as documented. Preventative measures, uh, they issued an operational pause, which are usually worthless. Uh, and they have consolidated appropriate word for command to eject across all pop publications. Preventative measures recommended. Uh, directive to be published, which outlines aircrew priority were an emergency during takeoff as a potential result in ejection near overpopulated area. So they actually they have now they're addressing that part, uh, or they should. That's what they've recommended. And then uh, additional guidance on low altitude engine failure, equal emphasis placed on uh, emergencies while away from their base and within metropolitan areas. Recommend research and implement a potential option to stabilize the seat. Uh, provide directive operators for uh, placing items between the seat and then acquire of FDR or CVR. Airworthiness investigation authority remarks, tragic incident highlights the importance of continuous situation specific training, minimize a reaction time and the importance of a timely decision. Snowbird 1-1's loss of power because of a bird strike occurred during takeoff, which like the landing phase is one of the most critical phases of flight for fixed wing aircraft. On takeoff, the aircraft is a low energy state, very close to the ground. The combination of these factors means the pilot has very little time to react in flight. It is a vital, well thought out plan that reflects the flight path environment, thus in the event of a critical emergency. Uh, it would be easy to fall victim to hindsight bias and second guess the action of the pilot. The pilot had moments to decide, zoom, and carry out the emergency checklist. The ejection sequence initiated this accident was well outside the safe ejection envelope. Uh, is recommended research development of potential uh, options to stabilize. And that's the end of that report. Okay, uh, my thoughts. Um, first of all, I'm not going to second guess what he did. Um, it is, he used his best pilot judgment at the time. It did not work out as he had hoped, and it's very tragic. I mean, that sucks. Um, I can understand, you know, avoiding populated areas, not wanting a ballistic aircraft to go crash into a neighborhood. If you remember several years ago, that happened at uh, Miramar where a Hornet crashed into a neighborhood after ejection and killed a whole bunch of people. It's not a good thing. Um, what I will say, though, uh, I know the Snowbirds are an awesome demonstration team. I know that uh, the, they're the pride of the Canadian Air Force or the Canadian Forces and they have done some awesome things. I do not understand why they're still flying a 60-year-old aircraft. I say this as someone who currently flies a 60-year-old aircraft, and I don't understand why we're still flying a 60-year-old aircraft. In 2021, these aircraft probably should be in a museum or owned by um, civilians who are, you know, have money like L-39s, T-33s, Warbird collections. I don't think they should be part of a premier demo team. Like I, I just, the fact that if you look at the instrument panel, that aircraft, my aircraft, whatever, I mean, it's unsafe. I mean, it really is. At, at, in, with today's technology, having an aircraft that old is a liability. A single engine aircraft at that is a liability. Having a seat that old is a liability. I mean, we have the ability to uh, upgrade them so they could probably put zero, zero seats at a cost. Um, they could do that. I mean, we don't do them with a T-38A. I have no idea why. It's money. I mean, the T-38C got Martin Baker seats, and that's a zero-zero seat now. Um, 
Captain Casey died because of flying in a 60-year-old aircraft. Like, I, I, uh, that, that's my opinion. Yes, there was pilot error involved in that decision, and they were outside of the envelope, but the envelope was small from the get-go. I don't know the politics behind it. I don't profess to know uh, what the Canadians are doing as far as, you know, how they, they view their demo team and, and what funding and stuff that they get. To me, a CF-18 would be a better uh, candidate because two engines and it represents what they actually fly in combat. They're not even flying these in training anymore. Even their old CF-5Ds would be a better choice than than the Tudor. I mean, I get it. It's cheap and it's single engine and it's low maintenance and all that stuff. But when you get an aircraft that gets into this life cycle and this age and you're putting it through these things, that's that's you're not giving them a, a great chance when you've got a seat that requires you to wear a parachute on your back out to the aircraft and then doing these high demonstration, high risk demonstration maneuvers. I mean, I'm sure half the routine they're out of their their envelope for ejection. I mean, there's a lot of points where it's like, well, if I eject, that's it. Because, you know, some of their inverted stuff, there's no way that chute's going to open, period, dot. I mean, they're just going to go right into the ground. So that, to me, I mean, that's my soapbox on the thing, is that I think these aircraft are too old for what they're doing. And if their aircraft aren't too old, then the, then the very least, they need to be upgraded. They need to have new seats. They need to have new avionics. They need to have the, the voice recorders. They, they need to have stuff that you would get in 2021 or 2020 at the time, not stuff that you would have in 1958 when they were probably designed. So to me, that's a foul. Um, I don't think any modern first world military should be talking about ejection seats failure. And that includes the F-16 that we had at Shaw. That's a modern seat and it failed. And that's a foul. Like that should, we should never be talking about an ejection seat failure or a failure to sequence because we're out of the envelope. The seats, the technology exists with a ACES or a Martin Baker, assuming that the seat was working properly, they'd have been in the envelope and they both would have survived. I, I just, I, I don't, it, it, it hurts me to, to be mourning the loss of someone like Captain Casey because of the last line of defense, uh, an ejection seat, just like measures mishap at Shaw with the F-16, where that seat failed, it's unsat. But we just, I don't know. Uh, to, to me, as, as a, when you put yourself out there and you put yourself, you're flying at the limit, you have to know that that seat's gonna save you. And for what they're asking the Snowbirds to do, that level of flying, and even though this was just a ferry flight, this was a point A to point B, it wasn't even a demo, but for what they're asking, they should have a seat that works 100% of the time and, and doesn't have an envelope like that. Like even the fact that, yep, you know, he didn't zoom straight ahead, that's fine. He tried to turn back to save civilians, that's awesome. Seat should have worked. They need to have better seats. Better aircraft or better seats, pick one. I don't, I mean, whatever you, you can fund, but I just think it's irresponsible to have to ask people to go out with old 60-year-old uh, ejection seats. I just, I do. Anyway, that'll do it for this one. I, I am, my thoughts are with Captain Casey's family, uh, Canadian military, uh, you're all allies. You know, we, we I've flown with the, the Canadians, uh, I've flown against the Canadians. They used to come down to Homestead. Uh, great group of uh, fighter pilots, great group of people. I'm very sorry for your loss. Uh, this is tragic. And unfortunately, like every other mishap we've done uh, in 2020, uh, highly avoidable. You know, it, we, we should not be talking about a fatality here. I hope this was uh, useful. Um, I hope this brings up a, dis a good discussion. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.